Dig with everyone, Kojima Atashi, and welcome back to a very special episode of the Inline G Flute Podcast. So, listen, I know a lot of you watchers slash listeners will be brand new to the Inline G Podcast. So, first of all, thank you for coming by. It is lovely to have you here. You're here for my chat with Sammy Sussman. So, listen, if you're on YouTube, skip to the next chapter. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, go down to the description and also skip to the next chapter. It'll be a few minutes away. Beforehand, I just have a wee introduction to do. This is unlike any episode of Inline G so far. Although I often do talk about themes such as abuse, toxic masculinity, abuse of power, etc, etc, this is different. So before I continue, this episode contains extremely graphic descriptions of sexual abuse, which some people may find very triggering. So please, if you want a lighter episode, wait until next week. On the 12th of April this year, Vulture magazine published an article entitled A Hidden Sexual Assault Scandal at the New York Philharmonic. It details an alleged sexual misconduct case from 2010 and the various related ongoing since then. Now this article has sent genuine shockwaves through the classical music world and I know a lot of my regular listeners have requested that I do an episode on this. This is unfortunately not a topic that I've been qualified enough to talk about nor educated enough. Something of this gravity requires the utmost respect as a topic. So instead, I reached out to the article's author, Sammy Sussman. Sammy very kindly agreed to come on and chat to me, and I am genuinely beyond thrilled to have someone like him agree to come on to this podcast. It's a huge moment for me personally. Sammy is an investigative reporter whose reporting often focused on allegations of sexual misconduct and assault in higher education and the performing arts. He has done reports on allegations at Juilliard, at the University of Michigan, at the University of Texas at Austin, and of course now at the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. The first half of this episode, Sammy chats about the allegations themselves. It's very enlightening. We then moved on to the reactions, the implications for the classical music world, and hopefully at the end, some kind of positive we can take from all this. Watching Sammy talk was a pleasure. I felt like I was just enjoying the podcast as a listener this week. It was a genuine pleasure. He is a virtuoso speaker, his work is spectacular, and it was a genuine honour to have him on the podcast. So again guys, this is the final warning. This episode is not easy listening. However, it is an incredibly important conversation to have. So if you're in the right headspace, I sincerely urge you to listen right to the end. There are a lot of important things that Sammy has to say. So, here is... This week's Inline G Flute Podcast with Sammy Sussman. Well, anyway, before we get into it too much, I want to be, it's a very delicate top subject, so I want to make sure I get everything right. I'm going to be a little bit pedantic throughout it all, but please bear with me for it. Um, and also bear with me and take my apologies because you are a very accomplished journalist. You've done a lot of work, and I do feel a little bit guilty that the first time I'm chatting to you, we're going to be focusing on essentially one single piece, but it is so significant, as we said. Um, so before we do it all, can you give a little bit of an introduction, first of all, to yourself and then to the piece we're going to be talking about today? Sure, yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, my name is Sammy Sussman. Um, I grew up in New York, so I knew a bit about the New York music scene kind of going into this story. I was in the New York Youth Symphony in the composition program. So I also, I studied composition at, at University of Michigan. It, yeah. I had some background, yeah, some background in the industry. I don't compose much anymore, but enough understanding of classical music to be able to navigate some of those kind of initial interviews where people are throwing mm-hmm. out names of summer programs or of, you know, conductors and stuff. And I, I, I know some of those people yeah. um, in terms of kind of what led me to journalism might be interesting. Um, I was a sophomore at Michigan in the music school and I learned of like, I was an arts reporter at the time, just doing reviews of, of concerts and stuff, trying to improve mm-hmm. my ability to write about <laughs> music and, and the performing arts. And I learned of um, sexual assault allegations against the uh, former, now former associate dean there, Stephen Ships, the um, violin professor, chair of strings mm-hmm. at the time, um, and, and the youth program director too at the time, I should say. And so I spent about six months reporting that story for our school paper. We published a wow. piece exposing um, four decades of allegations against him. He was fired yeah. and, well, he resigned in lieu of being his employment being terminated. He was later prosecuted on the largely on the basis of what we uncovered um, he's now in prison. Okay. So that body of reporting and seeing that ability for like a random sophomore, a student reporter to make that difference yeah. really 
to go into reporting. And then some of your listeners might be familiar. I reported for Van a bit. So I reported about Dan Welcher over at um, UT Austin and kind of the, mm-hmm. the history of sexual misconduct allegations against him that yeah. had gone seemingly unaddressed. And then um, this past December, I reported on sexual harassment and misconduct allegations against multiple professors in Juilliard's composition department. Yeah. And that's what led me pretty directly to this story. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is a lot going on at once. Um, yeah. Again, sorry, this is going to feel pedantic and I'm going to obsess a little bit over details here, but I do want to get this really right. And it is a very sensitive topic. So the piece you wrote recently, it was released 18 days ago, 12th of April. You've been working on it for, you said to me about 10 months now overall. Yeah. I would say I, I got the police records back in, in mid to late June. Um, so yeah. obviously the first step with these sort of things is you file a records request, you pay the fee, you get the records yeah. back and then try to build reporting on top of that. So, yeah. Yep. And these are referring to allegations that were made. This all started way back in 2010, June 24th, yeah. 2010, as far as I'm aware is where the allegations were made. So it has been a long time. It's been, a, I think it's been a topic that has been discussed quite a lot in the classical music world over the years. We've all seen a couple of different things about it, especially in 2018 as well. And now suddenly it's came back in the last 18 days with you. Um, so on that, do you think we could perhaps try to build, just for the listeners who are maybe a bit more unaware of it, a general kind of timeline of what was reported? So maybe you could start with um, Kara's allegations and also the law enforcement responses at the time. Yeah, sure. And, and we'll split between law enforcement and the Philharmonic just because it can get confusing how those two intersect. Thank you, yeah. And obviously yeah. they're happening at the same time. Yeah, perfect. So... Um, we should preface also by saying that um, the two people I'm going to speak about, um, so Matthew Mucky, who's an asso- assistant or associate uh, Trump, principal trumpet, mm-hmm. I forget which one, I'm sorry, in the New York Philharmonic, and yep. Leong Wang, the principal oboe, they both, cool. through their attorneys, they deny all allegations against them. And yep. they point to the fact that um, in 2020, when this case is arbitrated, um, they are reinstated to the Philharmonic. Yep. And so they use that yep. to, to point to the alleged... Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. So... Um, so then to, to go into the allegations, so in July 2010, on July 24th, 2010, um, the New York Philharmonic is in Vail. Um, Kara Kaiser, the main subject of my reporting, she's mm-hmm. the she's a French horn player in the mm-hmm. orchestra. She's hired about a year earlier. Um, mm-hmm. She's the second woman to play in that section. She's really yeah. close friends with Amanda Stewart, the, the first woman who's a, who's a trombone player. Um, and so Kara, they play this concert on the 24th. Um, that night, she goes to an apartment of a colleague. There's about 10 of them there. Um, I note in the story that someone takes a photo of her sitting next to Matthew Mucky, and her hand yep. is behind him on a couch. And yeah. that photo is later passed to the police. There's some interest in that. But yeah, yeah. she finds out that night at, towards the end of that gathering at this colleague's apartment of about 10 people that um, her husband, who's flying into Vail, is going to be a couple hours late. He's supposed to get in around 10 or 11. He's going to get instead get in around 1 or 2. And um this isn't in the piece, but they also both told me he had a normal nine to five. She always worked orchestral jobs. It was not un- un- you know, yeah. unusual for him to for him to get yeah, in. Yeah, come and join her after work late then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. or she'll go do something, he'll meet up with her, or yeah. she'll come home and he's already asleep. They, they didn't always line up in that way. So yeah, very she common decides in the classical music um, world, Mucky yeah. and Wang had, Mucky had rented a condo. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wang was staying there sometimes. They had rented a, a vehicle together. Um, you know, she wanted to just see this condo and hang out with the two of them. She didn't really think anything of it. There's some colleagues. She'll spend an hour or two there from what at least she says. And then she'll go home when her husband shows up around one. There's really nothing else to do in that intervening time. Um, she goes to Mucky, Mucky's condo. She says that uh, none of them dispute that they all, that the two men got in a hot tub that was out on the porch. Yep. Kara sat on the side. They, she says that they asked her to get in the hot tub with them. She declined. Mm-hmm. Um, she and Wang dispute who poured a glass of wine. Wang yeah. says that the glass of wine is closer to her, but um, she says that she saw him pour her the wine. But yeah. either way, she drinks a glass of red wine and remembers mm-hmm. nothing from the rest of the yeah. night. The next morning, she wakes up. She's lying in bed next to Mucky. She um, doesn't have any clothes on, and she um, she gathers the clothing from around the property. She notes that some of her clothing has been cleaned and there are red stains around the bed that she later learns is her vomit. Um, she asks mm-hmm. Mucky what's happened to her as he drives her back to her hotel. And he, she says that he won't look her in the eye or tell her 
what's happened from the police station. She decides, sorry, I should say, she speaks to her husband, she speaks to her colleague, she goes to this rehearsal, she sees Wang and she's shocked and a couple different people see that. So the orchestral manager, Carl Schiebler at the time is immediately notified. He tells a doctor who calls the police mm -hmm. and the law enforcement process starts. So from there, a couple key things in the law enforcement process is that um, Kara, uh, a SANE exam, sexual assault nurses exam is conducted yep. on Kara and on Mucky, um, who's the alleged, obviously, assailant in this case. Mm -hmm. um, the SANE exam, Kara says that when she gets back to her hotel the, the morning, um, you know, after she wakes up and after Mucky drives her back to the hotel, she says that she finds a tampon um, lodged far enough inside of her that she has trouble removing it. Yeah. That's later collected by the police and tested, and Mucky's genetic material is found on it. That's the only male mm -hmm. genetic material that's found on that. So that's taken also, um, you know, tested against the genetic material conducted in that SANE exam. And, yeah. There's tested for 10 drugs, but um, pretty significantly not GHB, which at yeah. that time was involved in like 5 to 15% of um, date rate. Okay. So it's according to the academic literature at the time. Yeah. Of course, that yeah. changes all the time. But um, expensive tests to do. GHB leaves the system in terms of blood, urine, and other bodily fluids incredibly mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. She's not tested within 24 hours. It's not run in a common SANE exam, not tested for. What she does do is she places a controlled call from the police station. So mm -hmm. she calls Matthew Mucky. She says, I, I forget if she says her phone died or she can't find a phone, but she has some reason yeah. that she says for why she's calling him from a rail, random uh, veil number. Yep. The detective is sitting right next to her, writing things down and whispering things to try to prompt her to get evidence from him. Mm. That's taped. I end up obtaining a recording of that call okay. uh, where Mucky wow. denies that anything happened. And he, he's very contradictory in a way that she feels indicates guilt. Um, okay. He wouldn't speak about that through his attorney. Okay. But um, she cooperates with the police. The police gather evidence from numerous colleagues who pretty much universally speak to Kara's character and the consistency of of what they imagine her account would be. Yep. Um, a number of colleagues uh, are not as positive when speaking about Wang and Mucky, saying that they'll mm -hmm. lie to cover um, cover up for each other. Some people saying that they find Wang to be sleazy, and they note that Mucky has been seen with different girlfriends or women on, yep. on different tours. One yep. specific colleague recalls an incident in which they heard the two men on a tour earlier that year talking mm -hmm. about a female musician and how much they wanted to sleep with her. There's yeah. Um, you know, it, the police report makes a, a pretty clear indication, at least of the two men standings in the orchestra versus Kara's. Um, but yeah, we all fly back to New York. Nothing is done about that case. Mm -hmm. Now, a month later, after they fly back to New York, Kara calls the police, according to the file, and says uh, that she was at a party and her husband was with her. And mm -hmm. the two of them had two colleagues approach them to say to tell them about another allegation of uh, sexual <laughs> misconduct against yep. Matthew Mucky from another mm -hmm. former musician. Um, mm -hmm. It's unclear from the police file. This woman would not speak to the police. We don't know the disposition of that incident. Okay. Um, obviously, both men deny it, or at least Mucky denies that incident. Yeah. Um, it's important to note, too, that that incident comes up later in 2018 when the orchestra looks into yeah. men, both men more fully. But Kara learns of another allegation. Um, a year later, just to go through the law enforcement process, sorry, to the end please of Please don't, no, please do yeah, yeah. A year later, um, Kara pays for a, a private uh, hair exam, hair follicle exam. Mm -hmm. They test, they find a spike in GHB, and they can date it because of the rate at which hair grows to around the time of when Kara was unveiled. It's only to about the nearest month or two. So it's yeah. not at all indicative. She's told that that can't really be used in the criminal process. And yeah. hair follicle testing at the time is new. Now we even understand it more. And there'd be different questions in terms of the, the legal case. But at the time, it was just mm -hmm. very new technology. Mm -hmm. Not okay. that specific, but she says okay. she would not otherwise be exposed to GHB. <laughs> she doesn't take GHB. She sees a yeah. huge spike in that according to the hair follicle test. And she thinks that's indicative that that's what she was drugged with because okay. she also can't otherwise understand why she has no memories of that incident. Um, yeah. She keeps in touch with the detective. She calls him periodically when she hears about new things happening at the Philharmonic, even after she's left, whatever's happening, at least according to the file. And then in 2015, she fly she's in Vail. Mm -hmm. She sits down in the police station with the deputy district attorney who should have been in charge of the case and the detective. And she says that the deputy district attorney wouldn't meet her. In the, he, he wouldn't look her in the eye, she said. He was yeah. fiddling with a paperclip. He sits there. He tells her there's not enough evidence. They're not going to move forward with the case. And my, at least the files that I've obtained indicate that at some point a year or two after the incident, 
the detective had forwarded something to the district attorney recommending prosecution. Okay. okay. So that case dies at the district attorney's level. Yeah. Um, one thing's not in the article, but worth noting is that they could reopen that seemingly at any time. Experts that have spoken okay. to it, given um, some changes in Colorado law and the specifics of this case, it okay. could very well be reopened. It's not outside the statute okay. of limitations. And um, the, the DA's office notes that as well to me in a statement, okay. but they've not done so at this time. Okay. So, and sorry, Wait. hopefully that takes you through the whole criminal. That aspect. is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. yeah that's very, very clear. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about then going back to the initial incident in 2010? Can you tell me a little bit about the New York Philharmonic's reaction to the allegations at the time? Yeah, totally. So, um, so as I said, the orchestra manager is notified literally the next day because Kara goes to this rehearsal. I forget if it's a rehearsal or, or the next performance, but yeah. You'll see that she's shocked. They immediately tell the orchestra manager who, according to multiple people in the orchestra, if this happened now, they would probably go to the orchestra mem like manager to report yeah. it, right? He's the personal manager. He's the person you should report these incidents to. So yep. Mara immediately tells him, he calls a doctor who calls the police. She assumes that the orchestra has been notified and that they're going to address it. Um, Kara, obviously, according to multiple sources, was offered an alleged NDA. We don't know if she signed that, but she couldn't speak yep. to me. It's important to note she could not speak to me about anything that happened in the Philharmonic after okay. um, Anything that I gathered okay. is from the police files because the police files were generated contemporaneously, right? It wasn't like an NDA that she signed later would allow them to delete things from those yeah. files. But she can't speak to me about okay. any of that. Instead, I rely on Amanda Stewart, the, the first woman to join the section. She joined a little yeah. before Kara. She's a tromboner. She's probably Kara's closest friend in the orchestra yep. at the time. So Amanda Stewart tells me that, uh, well, first of all, one thing I should note, there's a different document that says that Matthew Mucky was on Kara's tenure committee up until that incident. Yes, He's I've removed read sometime after, we don't know when, and he doesn't actually vote on her tenure decision. On, yeah, so, yeah. No. So Amanda says that um, Kara comes back to New York. She hears from Kara that she's at that party with her husband when she learns of another sexual assault allegation against mm -hmm. Mucky from a former mm -hmm. musician. Mm -hmm. um, Amanda says, you know, Kara's rightfully quite horrified to learn that two of her colleagues knew of this uh, allegation and did nothing to protect her up until that incident. Um, Amanda's also horrified. The orchestra's um, on tour in Europe later that fall, and Kara's gotten a restraining order or an order of protection that prevents yes. Mucky from getting yeah. uh, close Too to close her. To her. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and that uh, order is modified slightly to allow for performances yeah. because there's questions about proximity right uh, well, a hundred foot yeah. order whatever that is is not going to allow a horn NSFB player orchestra yeah yeah and especially if of they're course, in yeah. both brass that just doesn't make sense so it's modified slightly in that way yeah um, the order is done in colorado but there are questions about it in new york um okay. to speak to kind of the records about it but so amanda says they're in europe in the fall and she takes a photo of mucky getting incredibly close to kara seemingly yeah. in violation of that order and she mm -hmm. says that you know the, the the photo would have shown that at least from her point of view that was intentional yeah um after that a colleague pulls her aside and says that she shouldn't keep supporting kara it's going to harm her tenure and she says that before that she had maybe one or two tenure committee members who had been consistently re recommending that she not get tenure and the rest of the 10 person nine or 10 person committee had been mm -hmm. recommending that she get tenure um amanda says coming out of that there was an emergency meeting right around Thanksgiving back in New York, where they say, yep. you're not playing at a standard that we expect, um, and you mm -hmm. won't be granted tenure unless something improves. And by the end of that year, Amanda is not given tenure. Yeah. Um, and she says that another member told her, uh, voiced to her that he was shocked that a non-tenured member would dare bring up any allegation against a tenured member. Yeah. And of course, not ref referring to, to Kara bringing an allegation. Yeah, yeah. Him. Mucky yeah. and that allegation specifically being of allegedly seemingly criminal date rape or uh, substance assisted sexual assault in yeah. an orchestra setting, but nothing to do with the orchestra. I, I think it also bears noting or the tenure process. Um, yeah. Actually, sorry, I mean, do you mind if I interrupt you just briefly? Yeah. Can you explain, just because a lot of the listeners to this podcast are European or British and we don't really have yeah. the tenure system here, can you explain oh, briefly sure. what tenure is? Yeah, sure, sure. And let me know if I'm going too long because it's a. No, no, it's great. No, please do. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, okay, yeah cool. Just tell us what tenure is because we, we do hear a lot about it and we know the American system uses it, but it's not something we're totally familiar here because employment laws are a little bit different in Europe. So just a really quick brief idea of what tenure is and the significance of it because it is a huge thing and it's a huge part of this case as well. 
Yeah, and a lot of the questions have come around that too. So, so definitely yeah. worth noting. So, um, the tenure process, at least as it works in the New York Philharmonic, I can't speak to every orchestra; they differ slightly. They're taken yep. from like this idea of tenure in academia. So, a year you join the orchestra. Um, if you're no longer subbing, you're given a position. You win a, you know, you mm -hmm. win an audition. You have like a one or two year path, usually at least in the New York Philharmonic. Um, over that one or two year, two year path, you'll face multiple kind of unofficial votes of this committee that's put together, and mm -hmm. the committee is of your colleagues, usually in your section. So for yeah. Amanda and for Kara, it's going to be brass musicians. Yeah. Um, nine or 10 of them, they're going to vote once or twice. They're going to say once or twice per year, I should say. I think there's like one in the first year, a couple in the second year where they yeah. say, um, we do think this person should stay indefinitely in the orchestra or we don't. Um, yeah. At the end of that process, they have a final vote that's a more formal vote where a tally is, mm -hmm. is literally taken. That's given to the music director and it's ultimately the music director's decision. So at that time, it's Alan Gilbert. He makes the okay. decision, but he almost always makes the decision based on the committee. So it's really, okay. yeah. He's yeah, all, I was just about to ask. They never, it, it, it is technically possible for the music director to override the decision of the committee, but it is rare then. Yeah, I, no one that I spoke to knows of any instance in which a music director has overrode a tenure committee. Okay. And on, on the flip side, in this case, it's Alan Gilbert that actually tells Amanda that both that she's having issues and then ultimately yeah. she won't be staying. Um, so the last thing to share about Amanda is that the next year, the orchestra goes to Vail pretty much every year. The next yeah. year, they go to Vail. And after their last concert, of course, that's Amanda's last ever performance with the orchestra in the same amphitheater where Kara decided to speak to the police. Yeah. Um, so Amanda pulls, goes to Alan Gilbert's dressing room. She felt like she had good rapport with him up until that point. She knocks on the door, enters, and tells him that there are huge problems in the brass section. At least from what she tells me, mm -hmm. there she mm -hmm. says that she told them there are huge problems in the brass section in the culture of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, and she says that he looked at her. He said thank you. She didn't really get acknowledgement about the severity of what she believed she was sharing with him, and she leaves the orchestra. Um, a year later, like I said, Kara is also not given tenure. She leaves. We don't know the circumstances of that. People around her say that she was offered an NDA. We don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've read a few things about that as well. But again, we are just we're. Yeah, we're assuming that, but that's pure speculation on my part. Um, just then to quickly complete the timeline a little bit, all this is happening in and around sort of 2010, a couple of years later. There is a couple of developments in 2018 as a result of the Me Too movement that took over America. Can you talk a little bit about what happened then? Yeah, sure. Um, so 2018, well, really October 2017, there's the reporting about Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. Within a couple months, the New York Philharmonic commissions this outside event. We don't know why they did that, to be clear. We don't know that it's tied to yeah. that. Me Too movement. Maybe it's a coincidence. Yes. All we know is that by December of 2018, they had commissioned Barbara Jones. She's a former federal judge in New York, really mm -hmm. an expert on these sort of things. She comes in, they spend over $300,000 um, yeah. on her investigation. She spent six months. According to some documents that I obtained, she interviewed 22 people. She reviews extensive document documentary evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and she finds that there's enough evidence for the New York Philharmonic to rightfully terminate the employment of Matthew Mucky and Liang Wang. Yeah, um, due to the allegations that, of what happened in 2010, just to be clear, yeah. In Kara's allegation and another allegation against Mucky as described, and we okay. say, we don't go into more specifics in the article, and I, I, I won't, I'm not quite ready to do that here, but um, yep. we do write mul uh, allegations. So not one, okay. but multiple okay. allegations, Plural. separate allegations of sexual okay. misconduct against Liang Wang. So we okay. know that he's present for Kara's allegation. She alleges that he poured her the glass of wine. We don't otherwise yes. know his involvement, but we know that besides being present for that, there are at least two allegations okay. against him. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I don't want to say more than just multiple, but No, yes. no, of course, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Orchestra looks into those, they fire them. The two men go to Local 802 of the American Federation of Musicians, mm -hmm. um, which is the you know New York City Musicians Union, biggest musicians, yep. local unit of that organization in the United States. They represent Broadway. They represent anyone who's coming through New York and performing on New York stages beyond okay. the Met, the Phil, the ballet, right? So really okay. big, big yeah. unit, if that makes sense. The current president of the overall AFM used to be the president of just Local 802 to give okay. So Wow, it's kind okay. Of a springboard yeah. in that way yeah to real um to yeah so um they bring they go to local 802 and say we want to challenge our firing we believe it's wrongful mm -hmm. um uh, from sources inside say that the union deliberated it allowed that um we don't know if this is common or not but the union says that the two men can pay for their legal fees a union mm -hmm. lawyer is just going to sit in 
the union and the Philharmonic agree on this arbitrator and the case goes to private arbitration. So it's not like court. The results are never going to be made public. The testimony is yeah. not made public. Kara alleges that she was, um, she testified in those proceedings and Mucky and his wife sat, you know, in the room when, when she testified. She notes that he later declined to testify, citing his Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination, potential self-incrimination, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so she says that she feels that that speaks a lot to the veracity of, of her claim and, and of his response. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but at the end of that arbitration process, I should also note the arbitration, my favorite fact in the piece, just from a magazine yeah. writer's perspective, the arbitration is done by a 71 year old I know what um, you're gonna arbitrator, say. lawyer, and part-time magician. <laughs> Man, every single article <laughs> I've said, in this, they, he's... it's always mentioned that detail is never left out. <laughs> it's always, well, some people said part-time musician <laughs> or magician. Some people said professional magician. So I'm not, I can't comment on his credibility, but he's definitely a magician in some sense. <laughs> Yes, there's a feature in the Washington Post in 20. So obviously, you know, when you write these articles, you Google everyone, do some background. Yeah. The first thing you saw with this, see with this guy, Richard Block, that's outside his arbitration decisions, is that um, in 2012, the Washington Post did a feature about how he's a magician on the side. And there's these amazing photos of him in a suit, holding a deck of cards and it like a, with red velvet chairs. And I don't know, it was just great. And it's great. <laughs> You know, also stories like this get fact checked. Um, so it's yeah. so funny to my fact check is like, where did this come from? And to pass yeah. that article along, <laughs> go back. Yeah, I'm forth. very glad. I'm very glad that that made the final cut as well. I'm glad you decided <laughs> to keep that fact in because it it gave me some it gave me a much needed respite in the middle of that article to go Ma magician. Am I reading that right? <laughs> it was fucking great. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Oh, yeah, I so, needed that, um, man. So so and so it's that guy that um, Richard Block. Um, who I should note too, we noted in the article, both Barbara Jones and Richard Block do not agree to speak to me. It's part of the reporting yeah. process, but I, yeah. I reach out multiple times, you know, I email, I call, whatever. Um, so yeah. he decides that the two men um, should be rightfully reinstated. And it's important to note that his decision does not comment on the underlying merit of the claims against the two men. He merely okay. notes that they have not met an evidentiary, sta an evidentiary standard. And he okay. applies quasi criminal standard um, the the burden of you know we talk about evidentiary standards of um oh my god preponderance of evidence sorry it took yes that's exactly the, the word yeah 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 preponderance of evidence is, is slightly more than you know whoever is 50 percent of the evidence plus one thing that's yeah it's actually it's weirder than yeah yes exactly exactly whoever has slightly more weight is going to be the one if you picture a scale yeah yeah, yeah. so that's how barbara jones decides the piece which is why uh, decides the case which is why she believes yeah. that um the men can be wrongfully fired. I shouldn't say decides, but in, that's how her investigation unfolds. Yes, yes. Um, Block operates under the standard of clear and convincing evidence, a quasi-criminal standard. Yes. And he notes um, that time has passed. He also notes in relation to some of the allegations that it's hard for the men to um, prove that they understood no to mean no, I believe is what he said. He said that yeah. it's hard for them to prove that, that no was said and that they did not have consent. Um, yeah. Which... I don't know. I included that quote because I think it's interesting to see that that's the the, the, the standards under which these sort of things. Operate. It's very important to mention that as well, and that is, I suppose, quite a common thing we hear in such cases as well. Is it's hard to prove consent, it's hard to prove lack of consent, and that is why there is so few convictions in these kind of cases as well. It is a very complicated thing in that sense, I suppose. Yeah, and I mean, Kara would note she's incapacitated. Her vomit is found around the bed. She has no memory of that incident. She feels that she clearly was not in a state where she could consent. Um, I mean, no. by Lucky's own admission in one police report, he says that she was vomiting profusely minutes after they engaged him when he claims oh, it's consensual man. sex. But she says that that's no state. She also notes that, like, she had a tampon and she would not consent in that state. But, well, um, yeah, it's, it's that's one of the key points, I suppose. Yeah, like, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah, but that has become one of the big things as well is obviously with a lot of men being involved in this case, anytime you speak to a woman about it, they're like, well, obviously nobody would consent with having a tampon in because there's a natural massive discomfort of it yeah sorry i'm gonna get i'm gonna try and take my emotion out of this a little bit if you see my reactions and i'm rolling my eyes or i start to saying fuck off just ignore me and keep talking okay um okay, yeah. this is I really mean, you, raise, you raise an interesting point though that's not in the article which is like the detective is a man the deputy district attorney is a man yeah um you know barbara jones is a woman she finds that there's evidence but otherwise it's a man who's the arbitrator um, uh -huh. The personnel manager that Karis talked to is a man. The person, the music director is a man. The president of the Philharmonic at the time and in, you know, and now are both men. The only man. woman really in that chain is, is 
Barbara Jones, who does this investigation, finds that mm -hmm. there's cause to fire them, and Deb Borda, who comes in around the time that the new investigation is <laughs> initiated, right? Mm -hmm. So there's really clear gender lines in terms of um, the you know, people in, in positions of power and, and how they address this case. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly that. So let's pick it up to where you just started. To just, I just want to finish this timeline, then we can uh, get into some other questions. So uh, Block comes in and sure. he reinstates the musicians in. So both musicians are reinstated into the orchestra. This is in 2019, I believe, 2020? 2020, yeah, in 2020. Yeah. They're paid huge amounts of money in back pay too. Um, yeah, so they, that, that's important to note as well. So when they weren't working in the orchestra, all the, the money they should have got paid, that is back paid. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we don't know either of their salaries, but I, I don't remember no. what Mucky's is, but Leon Wang's obviously a bigger figure. He's the principal oboe, but he's paid over $700,000. Um, sorry, $700,000 yeah. a year? Oh, uh, no, no, for no, this, in, oh, no, for this payment. Back pay okay. over this 18-month period. Okay. But okay. He's also, okay. um, he's faculty at MSM as well. So yeah, so, yeah how yeah. much money he's making. Yeah, 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 he's all right for money then, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, and I, anyway. just, I think it also speaks to like the the power imbalances here. The the sources say that like Kara's alleged NDA is in the six figure range, but I've um, heard this. Yeah, yeah, she has to leave New York. Um, you know, once she leaves New York, is she going to be able to find an orchestra job that's going to pay anywhere near that? Versus, especially if you think about the legal fees that that the two men are going to accrue as, as they pay for these lawyers to defend them, it's it's really interesting to think about how much money uh, Leon Wang might have at his disposal to pay for lawyer versus Kara, right? And, and yeah. And, and, well, that that's gonna play out yeah it so. fucking is yeah it fucking is yeah uh, yeah sorry um so yeah they're both reinstated 2020 and then pretty much nothing on that until your article was there any developments in between 2020 and 2024 then not that we report in the piece but i would like to okay. say in this because i've shared it a bit on twitter um okay it has been interesting to see some musicians in the philharmonic who were not there at the time especially some women say that mm -hmm. they are really concerned about how this whole thing was handled. Um, and so I do think it bears noting that I emailed Mucky and Wang, um, mm. I believe five or six times since September. Okay. I know I started reaching them in September once I felt like I had enough to potentially move forward with the story. I emailed yeah. them repeatedly, received no comment until days before publication. Um, okay. The Philharmonic became aware of my reporting in October when I sent them a detailed okay. list of questions. They've responded with some things, but mostly saying that they wouldn't comment on the specific case. They would only show me new policies. And they've known that I've been reporting since then. So I just think okay. it bears noting that in January, Mucky is selected to play on young musicians' concerts where he's brought into mm -hmm. local high schools throughout New York City. Um, there's a video of him playing trumpet posted on the Philharmonic website. That yeah. is at least two months after they became aware of my reporting. Yeah. Um, and that is not something that was mandated by arbitration. There's nothing in the arbitration that says that he had to be afforded that opportunity to play yeah. before young people or represent the orchestra in that capacity. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I can't okay. say what the decision making was. I have no reporting on that. I, um, I've spoken to musicians who say that it really makes them question the, you know, the the judgment of leadership. But I have nothing on, well, on what the model was there. Um, so just to finish that up, then obviously your article comes out 18 days ago. Now the New York Philharmonic's position has changed quite a lot. They have released a statement, I think, three days afterwards with some pretty big news. Um, do you want to tell us what has happened then, officially from the New York Philharmonic side since the release of the article? Yeah, sure. And it's been interesting too. I mean, what happens in these situations is you, you know, as a reporter, we call it getting read in. You just, you get to know so many people inside the organization. So okay. um, we publish the piece. I hear by the next day that the two men have been re removed from rehearsals and performances. We make so they removed the next day? We, well, they didn't play on the next, the concert that night, the next night. I know wow, that. Wow. Okay. Um, musicians okay. are already telling each other that they've been removed indefinitely. I make that public wow. by Monday okay. or Tuesday, that statement goes out that you're referencing. Yep. Um, yep. Since then, the Philharmonic has said they're going to commission an outside investigation. And it's yes. really important to note that that investigation is going to be much more broad than the 2018 one. Mm -hmm. They haven't said if they're reinvestigating these two men. We don't know if they can. That arbitration was binding, right? They fired them for okay. the based on Paris case. An arbitrator came back and said, you can't do that. We don't know if they can reinitiate in that way, but they've commissioned yeah. a large investigation to look at seemingly large because it's going to investigate the recent culture yeah. of the Yeah, well, that's the words they used. They said they've launched an independent investigation into the culture of the New York Philharmonic in recent years. They also don't specify what recent covers either. Yes, which is a very good thing to note. Yeah, and um, outside the Philharmonic too, in terms of immediate response, uh, Liang Wang has put on leave from MSM 
and okay. MSM announces that they have a separate investigation. They've commissioned someone else wow. to look okay. at allegations against him. They don't really clarify if they know of allegations specific to his time at MSM. Okay. Or if they're looking at what I reported to make a decision about his employment there, very unclear. Mm -hmm. But they've commissioned this investigation. They're also looking into it. And presumably, they haven't said if they're going to make the results public, I believe. Whereas I know that the Philharmonic... The New York Philharmonic intend to, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So just to clarify then, Mucky and Wang, they're on essentially guarding leave. I believe they're still being paid at the moment by the New York Philharmonic, even though they'll not be playing or rehearsing. From what we know, Yes. Yeah. Um, it is important to know, though, that the Philharmonic contracts from some musicians that I've spoken to are um, binding, so they do have implications in terms of either men's ability to play elsewhere. So it is okay. kind of interesting that, like, while this process plays out, we don't think that they'll be able to perform with other orchestras or take oh, wow, other okay. like, master class engagements in that way. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the question becomes... The Philharmonic has made it, musicians are telling me that the Philharmonic has made it quite clear that they don't want the two men back on stage just because of okay. how it would affect the, at least we don't know that about the entire Philharmonic, but certain administrators have voiced that they do mm. not want them back on that stage for um, some reasons to some musicians in, in orchestral meetings and such. Um, okay. If Great. as the orchestra tries to navigate that, they could potentially tell the men, well, we can keep you in these seemingly binding contracts that really prevent you from taking outside engagements. So yeah, we'll continue okay. to pay you, but you can't really play in general. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so that seems to be the leverage that the musicians have, that the Philharmonic yeah. has over the musicians. Obviously the musicians can point to this arbitration and say, you tried to fire us for the same thing. It didn't work. Why are you reinvestigating again? Yeah. And um, lots of questions there. This is a very untested area of law too. I know that the local 802 made a statement that they want to look into it, but again, no one really mm -hmm. knows what, who has the ability to do that or what that looks like. Yeah, exactly. And I think even with the New York Philharmonic statement itself, there was a little bit of room for, um, yeah, I'm just trying to find exactly what it is. So that was the thing I wanted to say, actually, as part of the, they have a statement and there's three steps in the statement. And at the end of the first step, it does say more details on the process will be coming shortly. So it is still relatively vague, I find, but that's for me to comment and yeah um so that was released on the 15th the monday again 18 days on the day of recording this podcast that the articles came out can you tell me a little bit about the general reaction you've been seeing yeah i mean it's been really shocking i mean i think um we talked about this a bit before we started taping today but like um yeah just you know working on the story for 10 months i um you know kara's story obviously felt compelling and just I have this police evidence. It's one of those rare cases where there's such substantive police evidence and it's such a specific crime. And you yep. can point to the failures of the, of the criminal process and like this, the, the, the classical music industry. I really didn't expect this response just from the classical music industry, specifically like the orchestral world. I mean, orchestras started putting out statements under like this hashtag, we stand with Kara. Yeah. Um, at least musicians is only one, one or two orchestras from what I know about put them out under their official accounts, meaning management agreed to it. But yep. so many musicians is groups where it's like you know musicians of the this symphony or that symphony yeah or collectives but, or etc as well yeah yeah it started i should say too um so kara is no longer in an orchestra amanda stewart who i mentioned earlier lives mm -hmm. in st louis member of the st louis symphony as a trombone okay. player kara have subs the, sorry have the st louis Symph have the st louis symphony made a statement on this yeah uh not the symphony itself but definitely the musicians have the musicians of the symphony photo, okay yeah they took a photo with kara and amanda in the center they put that out with the, huh. Um, which okay. is very nice to see. Yeah, and I was Incredible. about to say the first orchestra actually to do that is um, Kara tours over the country. Just well, I shouldn't say tours, but she goes all over the country to play with orchestras to sub yep. horn. So she's out in Seattle actually, coincidentally, on that Friday. Okay. Okay. She says that you know some folks she knew some of the musicians out there from pre-existing relationships, whatever. Yeah. So they all see this piece. It comes out early that day. A lot of them have read it by the time that she gets there to play the concert that night. And a bunch of them ask if they can take a photo with her. And so okay. um, the first photo that gets released is this photo um, of a bunch of wow. Seattle symphony musicians with Kara standing in the center. They don't really make a big deal that she's in it, but if, you know what she looks okay. like, she's standing there. Yeah. Um, and they release a statement of support. And that kind of, that's kind of what kicks it off. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So a lot of music, or sorry, a lot of institutions that came out with different statements to varying degrees. Um, the musicians of the New York Philharmonic did release a statement as well. <sighs> 
I'm going to read the statement now because I'm quite curious to see what you think of this. I mean, obviously, you've read this, but for the listeners, I will read it out. So this is the musicians of the New York Philharmonic. It's important to say this is not the New York Philharmonic themselves. This is not management. These are the musicians. But they've said, in light of recent events, we, the orchestra committee of the New York Philharmonic, believe it is imperative that you hear our voices. We wholeheartedly denounce and find a bar in all conduct that violates and degrades the women in our orchestra. Such conduct is an affront to women everywhere. It must never be tolerated. We call on all our fellow musicians and the Philharmonic Symphony Society to provide a safe environment so that no one is afraid to come to work. Now, that's it. Now, my honest reaction to that when I first saw that was that felt ChatGPT to me. That felt like it was ChatGPT writing me up a statement to make on this. What is your reaction? Or what, well, I suppose you can't give me your exact reaction to that, but can you tell me a little bit about the different kind of ones you're seeing here? Yeah, I mean, I think... There's a lot of questions, right? Because I think, first off, who are the musicians that drafted this statement? Do they really speak for the entire body? Obviously, yeah. beyond Mucky and Wang, I mean, it's important to note that, like, there are a couple musicians in the brass section that are named Alan Bear, Ethan Bear, yeah. the two specific musicians who are named in the piece. Yep. Ethan, Ethan and Al, as um, a lot of people in this piece refer to him, um, mm-hmm. you know, the reporting shows that they both came to Kara and spoke to her at that party right when she got back in New York in 2010 about mm-hmm. this other allegation mm-hmm. against Mucky. Presumably, they've known about two allegations against him since then. Um, there are questions about other members of the brass section and, you know, posts they've made on social media mm-hmm. with the two men, especially in the time between when some folks became aware of my reporting and when it mm-hmm. published. Um, I mean, I think without more transparency, we don't know how many musicians this represent. We don't know, is this a plurality of the orchestra? Is it the entire body? Like, have those folks changed their mind about how they feel? Or is this a subgroup yeah. of musicians trying to speak as the collective? Um, I mean, I also think it, it's hard. It's hard for Kara, I, I believe, at least, you know, speaking her with her since then, because she did not feel that support while she was there. She has not felt that support okay. over the past decade. So um, 14 years, I guess, not even more than a decade. So I think it's, yeah. it's kind of shocking to see that there now. I mean, I do know just from some conversations with some folks, they did not know the severity or extent of Kara's allegation. And so there's that okay. reaction. Um, what they might have been told by by some folks, primarily in the brass section, but just as, as the rumors spread within the orchestra, mm-hmm. they were told of a, an allegation that merely involved drinking or something that was, um, yeah. you know, okay. wasn't as there wasn't this body of, of, like I've said, evidence collected by the police that really yeah. speaks to a very serious incident in which Kara clearly alleges that she was in no state to consent, and so some folks say that it's that realization that's led them to rethink their position but okay. i think it remains to be seen what what that actually represents about the orchestra i should also say i know um speaking to multiple folks that um gustavo dudamel obviously is coming in as the new director yet yeah. new music director he happened to sub this past week on a concert unexpectedly due to some yes i saw that yeah yep yeah so um first in, his first engagement with the orchestra before that performance that night um, for multiple musicians in the room, I've heard that he spoke about this and said that um, the culture can change and that it must change. So interesting to hear him make that statement. Interesting to see where he sits on all this too. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I did see that statement as well, yeah. Um, I think one of the things I'm seeing is by statements as well is there is a lot of pressure from people on social media to push all the institutes to make statements. Is that something you kind of expected when this article was written or what, is that something you anticipated coming out that people would be pushing the likes of the Curtis Institute of Music, different schools, different orchestras to really push them? Not at all. And I should say, I mean, this piece is so narrow in its focus, right? It doesn't even deal, it deals with a, a, a personnel manager, a executive director, a CEO and president of the Philharmonic and a music director, none of which are still there. So to me, it was also crazy because yeah. I'm reporting about like previous people in this institution. I'm, you know, it's the oldest orchestra in America. Presumably yeah. it represents larger problems, but it's so narrow in its focus. It also looks at one of what we know are two allegations against Mucky and multiple against Liang Wang, right? It, it, it looks mm-hmm. at just one of those. It, it's so narrow in its focus, and I had no idea that it would have that sort of weight. I mean, I think it's great. One thing that I have been asked about these statements that orchestras are posting, and I mean, mm-hmm. investigative reporters, we always look for standards to hold people against, right? We okay. What is investigative reporting? When you think about it, it's... Um, at least I would argue it's uncovering information that's not in the public domain and holding that against mm. 
what should be a, a standard of, of, you know, moral standard, legal, legal standards are easier, obviously, or yeah. company standards, whatever. Um, but standards of conduct to which we hold, try to hold people to by exposing something. And so all the orchestras making statements, I hope that if anything happens in that orchestra, musicians can point to that statement and said, but you said this about, about Kara. I, I, I do wonder, like, um, for Cincinnati Symphony, the orchestra that this statement went through management, I realize if they, I wonder if they realize what a commitment that is in terms of what they've now said they're going to do in terms of their culture. Yeah. Well, on the different reactions that we're getting towards this, um, do you think there's anything, I hesitate to say this, but is there anything missing or is there anything, is there any questions we're not bringing up or that maybe should be looked at as part of the reactions we're getting to this? Yeah. That, that's or a questions very maybe or topics to talk, maybe this could spark new debates. Yeah. I mean, a couple of just things, like I can just tell you some things that, um, that didn't make the orchestra is like um, Matthew Mucky, um, that didn't make the orchestra, sorry, that didn't make the article. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Matthew Mucky taught at Rutgers. Um, Al Bear was the, Alan Bear was the chair of Rutgers, the, the brass department at the time. I, I have some questions about that. I, you know, not something that was in the article, but definitely something that bears more, Examination. Sorry, can you just um, clarify exactly what that is? Uh, Rutgers, just for especially oh, for the European University. audience. I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Rutgers University. It's in New Jersey here, um, yeah. but drivable from New York City. So some yeah. folks from the Philharmonic are, are on the faculty there. Um, yeah, and, and a fairly prestigious university, to say the least. Yeah, and Mason Growth School of the Arts. Uh, you know, a, a yeah. good music program there. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I should say also. I mean, Albert. Obviously, Albert is also on faculty at Juilliard. Um, I think there's also questions about like. Eric Ralski, the um, the he's a former horn player in the French horn player in the Philharmonic that's now in the Met Orchestra. He leaves in 2010. Okay. So he's the person that's most willing to be quoted in my piece because he says he ran into Kara in Vail like days after what happened to her. He was friendly with her. They talked about it a bit. Okay. He hasn't kept in touch with her since then, but he remembers how shocked she was. And he left that orchestra because he hated the culture. <laughs> and he's very okay. explicit about that in the piece, saying that he's never he's played with seven professional orchestras. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, lengthy engagements with seven, at least seven and has never seen a culture that's as toxic as what he experienced there. So I think big questions about the culture there that need to be addressed that extend far beyond this piece. Um, and yeah. then last thing, just the NDA with, with Kara and the fact that there's another woman who could speak about Mucky. She has not come forward. There are presumably other women that could speak about Leon, just given that there were multiple allegations against him. None of those people have come forward and we don't know if they can legally, we, we know that yeah. multiple people believe Kara couldn't, I mean, Kara couldn't answer my questions. Let's say that first off, yeah. um, but multiple people that said that there were talks of a six figure settlement that um, involved some sort of stipulation that you could no longer neither acknowledge that there was a settlement or mm -hmm. speak to anyone about it. Right. So what, what happened yeah. to her? So yeah, well, I think that's one of the, one of the most yeah. interesting things that came from this as well. There was a group I saw called the Composers Collective. It was just essentially a group of artists and composers. And their open letter that they launched was specifically to criticize the use of NDAs in the New York Philharmonic, which to be honest, was not something I would have considered straight away, but it is great to see that as reaction. Yeah. And, and I mean, um, also interesting. Alleged though, that... use, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. And no worries. Um, and that, that um, group that you're speaking about are women that I spoke to for the Juilliard article. That's what brought them ah, together. Okay. It was also kind of a full circle moment. I mean, I've, I've spoken wow. to them about that, but it is also crazy that like their article about Juilliard and seeing the immediate personnel change. Well, I guess it took six months, but pretty quick personnel change at Juilliard and this outside investigation, you know, mm. substantiating what they told me in this article. Um, that's really what led Kara to, to be comfortable with her story being told in this way. So I think oh, also wow, okay. there's kind of that immediate connection that's now playing out in real time as you see this collective advocate on her behalf in a way that that's incredible. might not be able to if she does want to be released from that NDA or, you know, all that's playing yeah. out in real time. Yeah. That is amazing. That's a really incredible full circle moment as well then for you. Wow. Yeah. Um, one of the other reactions actually I saw on it, I don't know if you're familiar with this, there's, got, there's a woman called Anne Midget who is a... Um, writer and critic does a lot of performing arts stuff she wrote a superb open letter today um and i have one quote of it i wanted to bring out as well where she called an open letter to the classical music field and one point she says to call out the bullshit on the sanctimony of institutions who stand um yeah and also yeah the main point she wanted to bring is institutions who claim to stand with Kara, but continue continue to invite known abusers to perform and teach and this is a really important thing because i've seen people like Catherine needleman and Larson john talk about this as well is what we can do to make sure we don't bring these people back known yeah. abusers that's a conversation that's being up about this as well yeah i mean 
And that's why I say that I think my view, I mean, Anne was a arts critic, right? So I, I totally understand what she's saying. And she's really playing the long game of like, she covered these institutions for years and years. Yeah. And I see a lack of change there. From my perspective, I guess, as a reporter, it seems very significant to see these statements going out and seeing they're being put out on behalf of seemingly the musician's body, right? I think that we're starting, you're starting to see standards be established, both in terms of musicians' negotiations with management and negotiations over a specific case. I think um, if someone, you know, if there's, I, I guess I know of at least one instance in which there's, um, if they, if it hasn't already started, there are going to be legal proceedings in a major U.S. orchestra over okay. another allegation of sexual misconduct. And in that case, okay. I do wonder that orchestra, there's a statement that's out there about some of the musicians in that orchestra. They put that out. So will that play into at least how it's handled internally, right? Can, can, the, can the alleged survivor or victim say, this is the statement that my colleagues made. You guys have to take some effort to support me. What you're doing isn't enough. Can the mm-hmm. alleged assailant say, well, this, you know, this is a culture that isn't tolerant of that. So can you please clarify what my rights are? I hope that this leads to at least at bare minimum, a clear delineation of how mm-hmm. these things are handled. Also, how far back do orchestras look? Like, like Anna is saying, well, what if you yeah. have a case where there's someone who did something, I don't know, 15 years ago, allegedly yeah. did something 15 years ago, but has done nothing since then. How do we, as a culture, look at that? I think there needs to be much clearer delineation of what standards are, what processes are. And that's where I think there's positive in this, even though, like Anne is saying, there's a lot of of maybe um, a lot of people trying to put out statements to get behind a culture that maybe they yeah. you know, folks like Anne would say they have not upheld to. to yeah. Empty. Yeah. Well, that's another thing that I do want to talk about then is the general culture that classical music has seen over the last few years. To be fair, this is not the first article of its type in the last few years. There have been many of these and well-known ones and high-profile ones. Um, obviously, you can't comment on this, but the Placido Domingo one was one I remember being a particularly big one. He's out there swanning about Europe now and doing whatever the fuck he wants. But anyway, um, there does seem to be, an, from my point of view, an ingrained culture of this in classical music, and it is getting uncovered more. Now, you've obviously covered this a lot in your work. Do you get a sense from previous work or even potential future work that this abuse of power is not only common in classical music, but maybe more so than other industries? Yeah, I mean, to answer that question, I'd like to draw on what Anne said again. Um, I mean, I also, we should say that she broke the story about Bill Prussell, um, mm-hmm. that, right? And at Cleveland Orchestra and the Cleveland Institute. I read that music. one today, yeah. Yeah, really amazing reporting. And that was in 2018, that summer. Um, so in that immediate Me Too period, um, when we were starting mm-hmm. to see these these stories in, in other industries, and she was kind of the first reporter, at least in my view, to really report on a couple different people and tie this Me Too movement and the larger American culture back to mm-hmm. this industry. Um, you know, she speaks in, in the same <laughs> the same open letter that you're talking about, about how, like, in so many instances, reporters feel like they're the last to know about these allegations, right? I mean, okay. I know that was the case at the Philharmonic. Like, uh, full disclosure, I'm 26. I graduated journalism school last year. Yeah. I was, like, I was 11 when this all happened to Kara. Yeah, I true. did not know about any of this until I went onto the scene. I think in so many, I mean... At this place, I can, in this case, I can use my youth to kind of cover up for that. But in so many cases, yeah. like reporters are literally the last ones to know about these stories. And then once we hear about them, we're the ones that try to make them public. But I, I do think yes. it's, it's really significant to hear all these folks in the music industry say, oh, this orchestra, there's this rumor. And this orchestra, there's this rumor. And um, so often it's like, if I could get my hands on that rumor to any degree of substance, I would try to report it. And so like, yeah. it, it's this weird game of like, we enter these situations where we feel like we've not, we didn't know about it, but everyone else assumes that we did. <laughs> and then once, yeah. we report it, once it's out there, then you see all these institutions, things flip on a dime and there's all of a sudden, um, there's public backlash. And so things need to move very quickly to respond to something that's been known to so many people for so long. It is yeah. crazy that in this industry, it really is ridiculous. Like I've studied in three different major uh, European conservatoires now, and every single one of them, there are these open secrets. They are everywhere. And now, even as I do this flute podcast, I'm interviewing quite a lot of famous flute players and bringing them on. The other day, for example, I published on my Instagram a list of my dream guests and people that I'd either got or had spoken to and they agreed to come on the podcast and a list of people I really hope to get on. I had to remove three names from that list within 15 minutes because people sent me a message going, he's done this, he's done that, he's done that. And I'm going, fuck is there anyone left like it is ridiculous but even when i was at college there was rumor more than rumors to be totally honest again open secrets that have lasted years there's people that have been teaching for maybe 40 years and it is a well-known thing but no one will talk about it yeah and i think to 
the one thing that I would like to do just to put a positive spin on that is I think occasionally you get these folks. I mean, I, you know, just speaking from like a personal perspective, I like, I respect Eric Rowski so much. Um, mm-hmm. He's on faculty at Juilliard. He's in works. He's in the Met um, opera. He has so much to potentially lose in terms of the backlash. And, and I mean, I doubt that he's standing necessarily as improved with his colleagues. Like Alan Bear is his colleague at Juilliard. I imagine yeah. it's going to be so awkward for him to go to work. I imagine there are folks at the Met that know yeah. brass players in the Philharmonic. It's going to be so awkward for him. But he was actually the first person in my entire reporting um, process over that 10 months. He was the first person to go on the record. And he just said that I explained Perfect to him what goodbye. I was doing. I kind of explained that I had this police report and that I'd be really focusing in on Kara's story and, and reporting the facts as I mm-hmm. could gather them from this report. And he immediately said that he wanted to be a part of that. So on the flip side, That's I think great. he... Sometimes you have people that are really amazing and it's not like, you know, Eric isn't an activist. I mean, I've called him a bit since then. He's talked about what this has kind of made him think about and how he's seeing this going forward, but he's not Kara. He's not going to be someone who's forever really going to be, was always going to be affected by this story and would always have feelings yeah. with this story, but he just says that he wanted to do the right thing, right? I hope that there are people, more people like that too. And I think Do you are. think this will maybe open the floodgates a little bit for that kind of reporting? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I know I've gotten stuff in my inbox. Um, yeah. Not to speak for Anne, but I am in touch with her. I know she's gotten some stuff too. I mean, yeah. I've also talked to Anne about how we can pass things along. I think um, arts reporters aren't always the best way to go with these sort of stories. And th- that's one thing that I should bring up in a second, if you don't mind. Okay. Like, well, the please question say. over why was I the one to tell that story is something that I still wonder when you ah. go back to questions to ask. Um, but but yeah, Anne and I have talked about like who are some reporters who might, who are some editors too that might assign a report of this, or who are reporters that okay. want to tell these stories. How can we pass along the the, the emails that we're getting to the right person? Yeah, um, okay. you know, I got an email. Let's say I'm making it up, but I get an email about um, I don't know Indiana University. I want to try to find yeah. a local reporter there. Let's get like a criminal justice reporter out there yeah. involved. I don't think it needs to be so. It doesn't mm-hmm. need to be you know, just classical music reporters that are reporting these stories. Because if that New York Magazine story shows anything too, it's that these stories can have an impact outside the field and, and will draw on readers yeah. outside the field. So, Yeah, well then, on that case, let's please talk about why you did do this article. And I'm sorry, I actually have that in my list of questions here, but I have been <laughs> engrossed by watching you talk about this. It has been fucking amazing for me personally, so I have totally forgot. I've lost all sense of the fact that this is actually a podcast. I feel like I'm listening to a podcast. It's been amazing. <laughs> You're the best guest ever. I have to do nothing here. It's amazing. So please talk about your own personal connection to this and why you did take the, take the article on. Okay, it's also funny because from my perspective, you're seeing why I'm a print reporter and not a broadcast reporter. I talk way too much to be able to do like... Uh, yeah, well, I think interview. there could be a career in this for you. There could be a career in this for you, yeah, no? <laughs> but yeah, so, um, I mean, I don't know why... I, I You know, I reported the story because I heard about it from someone who knew Kara, didn't mm-hmm. speak to Kara until a little bit later, but I knew that there were these police records. Once I got those, I knew that despite her NDA, there'd be a, a significant story to tell, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't phrase it quite right. What I was trying to get it is like, why did it take until now to have this story come out in that way, right? Like, why did the film? I mean, the New York Times' art section, which reports on the Philharmonic, probably, I don't know, maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but I feel like they have the most extensive, like, day to day coverage of the Philharmonic. I would just, assume so. Yeah, just the ties to New York City, right? They're right here. Um, Javier yeah. Hernandez, great reporting in that regard, just covering the day to day changes. But yeah. he wrote a piece. Um, a couple of years ago about how the Philharmonic was now 50% women. One of his colleagues in 2018 wrote the piece about unspecified allegations of misconduct. And if you're just listening, I'm putting unspecified in quotes because I think that yeah. phrasing is so specific and so important that we're in that immediate Me Too period. And we see folks online speculate about if the allegations against the two men were about sexual misconduct, but instead the, the times can only write about unspecified misconduct. And then there's no follow-up in 2020, the men are reinstated and there's no, follow up reporting. I can't speak to if they tried to pursue the story and they couldn't get it, but it seems really significant to me that they're writing these stories about the gender parity and the 50%, the orchestra is now 50% female and they're not writing these accountability stories that, that yeah. really also need to be told. Yeah. Oh, I'd never forget that. I remember when the article came out where it said unspecified misconduct and I was like, what the fuck? Everyone knew. Everyone knew what they were talking about. Like, we all know, but you guys aren't going to type it. It was fucking insane as well. And obviously, with the timing of it being just after the Me Too movement, you are going to speculate. Everyone's going to speculate then. And you don't have to speculate. You could just do it. But yeah, anyway, sorry, continue, please. Yeah, no, no, it's it's crazy. And I think also, um, I mean, one thing that we found just quickly in our reporting is, yes, the orchestra is 50% female in terms of the overall musicians' mm-hmm. body. But it's... I. I 
forget. Let me check exactly what it is in the in the article. I believe we said one quarter of the we call them like leadership positions. The um, wait. so principals, lead, section leaders, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna find this because I don't want to get this wrong. It's either a third or I'll be conservative about. It. I'll say it's a third. At least okay. it's, yeah. at most a third, depending on exactly what the fact check came down on. Because yeah. we have to. We have to determine is the librarian a member, all that sort of stuff. But yeah. anyway, it's significantly less than half of the principal and associate positions in the at okay, least. Okay, there we are. That. Significantly less than half the principals are women. And so what questions does that raise about also how this story a PR department can put out a story about gender parity coming out of the Me Too movement and how they want to be perceived in that way. They have a big commissioning project to bring you know, women composers and their works into the orchestra, mm -hmm. but they've never had a female conductor. The first two women to nope. play in the brass section are brought out. There's no women in the percussion section right now. And yeah. still the leadership is not, you know, the, the, the principal positions are not achieving parity at all. No, and I think that's quite reflective of a lot of orchestras at the minute in general, especially in Europe as well. There is a huge issue with that in Europe. You know, it's been well documented with the Vienna Philharmonic and their relationship with women. Um, but even in Germany, um, I think France generally seems to be doing a little bit better. I start, I did a little bit of research on this on Parisian orchestras and their flute membership. And I know that they have, I think, again, oh, I don't want to fuck up this number, but I think it was something around 67% of all salaried flute players from Paris were female. So there was a little bit of it, but even still, it's nowhere near where it should be. And it's maybe as bad in Europe as it is in America. So it's it's a worldwide issue, certainly. Um, I feel like the American orchestras did jump quite quickly to do things like female composer concerts, do a lot of things with gender um, representation stuff within the orchestra. But I do sometimes wonder, is this just saving face? Yeah, and I think with flutes also, you touched upon a very important issue, which is also like the inherent associations that we have with specific uh, instruments or sections and, and gender. Yeah. Um, like also the, the Philharmonic's percussion section being all men seems significant to me. First woman to play in the orchestra's a uh, harp player, right? Like there are also these deep associations. I know, especially mm -hmm. in this reporting, there's been this perception of like the low brass world is very male, male, heavy, yeah. male dominated. And, and I'm seeing so much now in terms of like the communications I'm getting about like questions about the low brass world and how it changes coming out of this because it's, considered to be this kind of old boys' club. And so, yeah. Well, that was one of the stereotypes I think we've all had at music college was that the brass department was always the, it was the lads club, essentially. It was almost like a football team more than anything else. Although I will say when I've studied at college, there are students, the gender, the gender disparity is not as big in college. And these are the places directly before the profession. So the profession should naturally reflect that. If people at college are 50-50 or more or less, the profession should reflect that. Any other industry, that would be the case. But again, as you said, in classical music, certainly with brass and percussion, it doesn't seem to quite match up. And then with flute, I think it's more accepted somehow for female principal flutes, or as you said, the harp, which is ridiculous because most major orchestras, we even have to specify now when you're saying the first female to hold a job after the harp, because that seems yeah. to be the only one that we sort of allowed in. And it's always like, okay, the first female principal excluding the harp because we let them in a while ago, you know, it's ridiculous. It's, it's totally crazy. Man. So yeah, I'm glad that there will be maybe, yeah, as you said, maybe like the low brass board having to look at their, their representation in general and what's going on there and new questions coming up about different sections of classical music and all this coming from essentially one article so i know it is a horrific thing and again it has been such a difficult thing to read this article like today um i spent a good six or seven hours today reading through not just your article but then other related articles going to different things really falling down a rabbit hole and man it was awful i felt like fucking shit today it was awful like i, I went back to the articles that i was reading maybe 10 years ago when certain scandals in the uk and europe and even here in Germany, it was depressing as shit. I really couldn't handle it. And, you know, yeah. I, I shouldn't say that, you know, but it is. And I suppose maybe the one positive that comes out of this, we are going to have a look at changing not just one culture, but multiple cultures within classical music, maybe classical music as a whole. Yeah, and I hope, I mean, at least from a reporter's perspective, I also hope, you know, I'm not an advocate. I'm not, it's far from my position to tell you, tell people what should change, how those things should change. I, I really just want to, put stories out into the world that I think raise these questions, both stories that should be made public and stories that raise really important, interesting questions. I think to that, yeah. to, to that end, I, I hope that we're starting to see people be more comfortable making their stories yeah. public. I mean, I hope if anything, all the 
we stand with Kara's statements. Um, much as we can criticize orchestras for maybe not upholding those values in the past, mm -hmm. I hope that it does make the next Kara comfortable speaking to me or to any other reporter. Yeah. Right. I, I hope that there's someone, yeah, someone there reading the piece, listening to this, who has thought about coming forward with a similar story for so long and seeing how she's been supported makes them realize that it's, it's both important to the public and potentially important to them to have it out there. I mean, mm -hmm. for Kara, this has been something that's been whispered about behind her back when she enters and exits musical spaces for so long. And now it's in the public domain. And I think we all now have to contend with it. It's, it's a really concerning, as you've said, if, if, you believe Kara's allegation, I think it's incredibly concerning the questions that it raises about criminal justice systems, about uh -huh. the orchestra, about the larger industry. But I think it's a story that we all now have to contend with. And it's not something that she's going to feel like is always just haunting her. Yeah, well, that is, yeah, that's definitely a net good as well. And just on that then, since the publication of the article, uh, what do you know about Kara's response? Have you been speaking to her? Yeah, of course. I mean, you, yeah, I wouldn't ever publish something like this and not be in touch. Um, I mean, I okay. would also obviously, I should just say that too, because we've referenced kind of some of the other allegations against the two men. Obviously, I make efforts to contact pretty much everyone involved in a piece. So I okay. email you know, Ethan Bensdorf, Al Bear, all those folks get multiple emails. Okay. Women who also maybe came forward with allegations, women who spoke to the police, women who spoke in the arbitration, anyone who's involved. They're going to get emails from me. I'm going to try to make those efforts. To that end, obviously, I keep in touch with Kara afterwards. And I think she, I mean, I, I don't want to speak too much to her emotion. I, of course. At the yeah. when she's ready to do that, I'll let her do that. I will yeah. say, like, it was pretty surprising to see in the New York Times, the most recent piece they had about this case, she seemingly referenced her NDA, um, her alleged okay. NDA. Alleged. Um, seemingly yeah. confirmed that, it, that it's out there because she said that she just wants to note that she... She doesn't name the Philharmonic by name, but she says that she just can't speak to her experiences with this institution still. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, and she says that in light of them announcing this outside investigation. So mm -hmm. she's seemingly confirming mm -hmm. that. I think, um, I mean, I know she was shocked to see the Seattle Symphony be willing to take that photo and put out that statement yeah. and, and some of the other statements that have put, been put out. I think, mm -hmm. um, I know that she wants to hear more from colleagues in the Philharmonic and like specific colleagues. Okay. Okay. Hear more than just that one musician's statement and who knows if that's going to happen. But I think, now. yeah, it's so hard, I think, for her because she knows the specific people that have spoken to her about this uh -huh. and that she feels haven't acted rightfully. And I think regardless of how the longer the larger world responds, it sounds like she's always going to, you know, have questions and wonder how those specific like I think her question is always going to be that one person who spread this rumor about me that later got back to me, has their yeah. mind been changed? And I, I don't know. I yeah. totally feel for her. I can totally understand why that's how you feel in this situation. Um, yeah. And it's just so hard, I guess, as a reporter, because that's, A, that's not my goal, but B, nothing that I can do can really change that. And not only am I not working towards it, but I almost ignore those concerns, right? We, we would yeah. have conversations before the piece came out and have to say, look, I'm not writing, I'm writing towards the public and I'm writing for potentially a skeptical audience, sure, mm -hmm. but skeptical on the merits, not someone who's tied up in the case, who already has enough knowledge that they can't be convinced based yeah. on anything that I could report. So, yeah, great. Well, before we, uh, we have talked for over an hour here and honestly, I could talk about this for five hours more and it will, it will not be the last time I comment on this as well. I've, I've actually got an entire solo episode planned for this as well to talk about my own independent reaction to this because I do have to, I spent this entire podcast and I might have to edit out my eyes. I have rolled my eyes back into my head so many times when I'm here a legend, I'm like, oh, fuck off, a legend, my whole, but anyway, um, thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything you want to add to this? Anything you want to mention? Anything you feel is important to talk to people about now? Um, I mean, obviously they can always contact me. You mentioned Anne Majette, so I'll throw yeah. her name out there too. I think, um, you know, I would say just, obviously I assume that a lot of your listenership is not also based in the U S I think there are amazing reporters like I know van where I used to work. I, I want to throw out a shout out to, to oh, but they're German as well. Aren't they? Yeah, they're German. They do really amazing work um, on these stories. They supported all my reporting up until this specific yeah. article. I just wanted the New York focus on this article. So I went to New York magazine, yeah. but yeah. they've done amazing reporting on really orchestras all over the world. So folks mm -hmm. should reach out to them. Um, I also think like, I guess, yeah, one other thing that, that I'd like to say is just going to the alleged and all that, I do think it's really important that like um, these two men were given ample opportunity to share their perspective on these events. They chose not to up until yeah, like, before we published. 
when they, you know, through attorneys, I mean, there's one communication that they sent to me that they made no claim that it was privileged or confidential. So I feel that I'm right to speak about it. But mm -hmm. all of a sudden, mm -hmm. like less than 24 hours before we planned to publish, which was a little bit before we did, you know, things come up in the last minute, whatever, mm -hmm. less than 24 hours before we planned to publish, all of a sudden they were threatening to sue me. And I fucking it, wankers. And there's still nothing. I mean, we got letters that seemed to imply that we were going to get sued. I, I shouldn't say that there was literally a lawsuit that was launched or we were provided papers to those to that end. But we were pretty explicitly told that there were plans made to, to, to sue. And I, I mean, um, I just think it's important to note that they've been given ample opportunity to respond and that they, um, you know, they chose not to engage over the six months that I was pursuing the piece. As Kara notes, she testified in the arbitration and Matthew Mucky sat there, listened to her testify and then said that he couldn't answer or say anything in that setting. So I really think yeah. um, what we have to say, alleged, not only do we have to say alleged, but we don't know the, the facts of the case well, so we have to say alleged because we should be accurate. But I think we accuracy, should. So, yeah, I just want to say that accuracy also bears um, being quite clear that they were given so many opportunities to respond. Yeah. And yeah. the choice was really not. I just want to mention that in my own personal Instagram and anywhere else I've talked about this case, everyone has asked me to cover this. I never felt like I was qualified to do it. So first of all, thank you so much for coming on and sharing so much with me. Again, it has been genuinely fantastic for me. Fantastic in a relative sense. Obviously, this is a very, very disturbing case is what's going on, but I really enjoyed doing this episode with you. So thank you very much for bringing your expertise and thank you very much for writing the article. It was incredibly important. It has really influenced the classical music world to a degree I've never seen before. And most importantly, thank you hugely to Kara. If you are speaking to her, please give us a big thank you. The amount of people that have matched me directly with support for her for being brave enough to come forward. I really hope it will inspire more people too. And I think it will. I've already seen an enormous shift in the last 18 days. So I think it's all uphill from here. And it definitely is an overall net good. Yeah. yeah and thanks for having me. Um, as I said, I'm very long winded. So thanks for also sticking through the very detailed <laughs> explanations. Cause so much of it is so intricate and like, cannot be yeah. summarized. <laughs> and no, I, and it like, shouldn't be summarized. That's why, but that's why a podcast is good because we can go as long as we want and we give it the time and space that it needs yeah. because I can't cut this down. I don't want to take any details out. I want to make sure it is, it gets its full space to breathe. Yeah. Well, so I feel like we did do it to, to extend some justice and yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, mate. And yeah, yeah that's all it is. Thank you for giving me your time as well. I know it's like three o'clock in the afternoon here. It's half ten at night here. So oh, gosh. Go <laughs> but thank you so, so, so much. It is incredibly appreciated, especially with how quickly you replied to my emails and got all on this. Um, it is really appreciated. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and then I'll just say goodbye to the listeners and thank you guys for all tuning in. And I look forward to hearing what you all think of the episode. Thank you. Cheerio.